I encourage you this morning, if you have your Bible with you, please begin turning. We will be looking actually at what may seem to be an odd resurrection passage, but we'll be looking in the book of Revelation. And in Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, we see John encounter Christ, the risen Lord. Now, of course, this is John the Beloved, the one whom Jesus loved. He's on Patmos. He is writing that which the Lord is revealing to him. This is what we have as the book of Revelation. And at the very beginning of this book, we see that Jesus is seen as holding something very important. Revelations chapter 1, starting in verse 17, John writes, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Here we see John, the disciple of Christ, who has lived for many, many years without Christ physically being on the earth any longer. He's lived seeking to spread the gospel. He's had, of course, experiences of greatness. He's seen the Holy Spirit do marvelous works. And yet one more time we see that John is able to see Christ in a beautiful way. And Christ is, of course, here reminding him of several truths. First, we notice that when John sees him, it tells us that he fell at his feet as dead. The idea here that this is not some ordinary man that John is seeing. This is not just some angel that John is seeing. This is our Lord and Savior who is worthy of honor and praise. And seeing him, he falls at his feet. And I love that Jesus says he laid his right hand upon me Jesus even in his glorified state even in being the highest and the greatest he still reaches down to that loved friend John and he tells him not to fear he says I'm the first and the last now what we need to understand is that Jesus makes it clear he says I am he that lives but I was dead And for us in today's day and age, even back in Christ's day and age, that is not a common occurrence. To see someone die and days later be alive. Now, we understand the reality with things of uh, medical nature that uh, there are many who may for a brief period of time pass away, but because of uh, having the ability that we have, we know, I, I just have it in my mind, I see it almost nightly. If you watch any type of medical show, someone, they charge, and they charge the person, and that person, typically, after a short period of time, they can be revived. But we're not talking about a short period of time, we're talking about Jesus being in the grave for three days. That is very, and it's not even to say uncommon, that is to put it lightly, to see someone be resurrected. But that is a miracle. And this is what Jesus says to John, I am that person. I'm the one who you were with those three years of my ministry. I'm the one who you saw day in and day out. You saw that I died, but now I'm alive again. And he says, I'm alive forevermore. And it's here that I want us to look at, as we've been looking in the last several weeks and months at the book of Mark, I want us to look at Mark's account of the resurrection. Mark chapter 16 speaks on the reality that his disciples and mainly the women who went to visit the tomb, they were 
I imagine, as we would be at the same point, filled with great sorrow, filled with great pain. They had just lost their Lord, their Master. The man, as Brother Jim this morning said, the man who was God in the flesh, and they saw him day in and day out, and yet he had died. What sorrow must they have felt? But here we see in Mark 16, starting in verse 1, the gospel tells us, And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher, at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment. And they were affrighted. And he said unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He's risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, as he said unto you. Now, what we must remember here is that as a result of sinfulness, death has become a common part of life. We all know someone at some point who has died. We all know, whether it be a relative, a friend, an acquaintance, we see death day in and day out. It's a common occurrence in today's day and age. And this is why they were seeking for Jesus in the tomb. This is why they went with spices, hoping to anoint him, wondering who was going to open the tomb door. Because death is now a part of our existence. Now, I, I'm reminded, Brother Jim, this morning, I, we were blessed to have a devotion from him. Uh, and it was such a wonderful reminder of the hope that we have. He had made mention of the fact that death is not, it was not meant to be our natural end. We were created to live. But sin entering in, as we'll see in moments, sin entering in caused death to occur. And this is why we see that when Christ dies and is laid in the tomb, they don't expect him to be anywhere else. Because everyone they had ever buried, perhaps with the exception of Lazarus, and maybe a few here and there that Jesus had worked uh, miracles on, they had seen every single person who had died be laid in the tomb, and that was it. So it's understandable that they're looking for Jesus among the tombs but we see this messenger tells them he's not here you can look at the place where he laid he was here most certainly he was dead but he's not here any longer he is risen and it brings to mind this reality that this is not a common thing this is very uncommon. In fact, it's miraculous. Why? Because of sin, death is typical to all mankind. Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. This is what God tells Adam in regards to what would come as a result of his and Eve's disobedience. Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 19. Look at what God says. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. God tells Adam, this is going to be the result of your disobedience. Not only are you going to have to work a life, you're going to have to sweat, you're going to have to work for a living, but you're also going to one day pass. Now, of course, the serpent had lied in this instance. He said, you will not surely die. 
And we know there were two deaths that occur. They spiritually died, but they were promised a physical death as well. And this physical death is laid upon any who's affected by sin. And that is all of us. I tell you today, there are many who live their life as if they do no sin. But I can tell you that this is simply not the truth. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, as Romans tells us. And because of this, we look at places like James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Because we sin, because we are born into sin, we are destined to die. James 1, starting in verse 14, James writes, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. We know this, this terminology here that he's using, it's, it's very much so reminiscent of uh, someone who is born. It says, when lust hath conceived, meaning when it has taken place, when the act of sin occurs, or when the act is acted upon, if you will, lust is acted upon, it brings forth sin, and sin always points to one place, one place only. And that's death. But thanks be to God that we do not have a Redeemer who was found in sin. Thanks be to God we have a sinless Savior, a great high priest. I'm going to use a passage that's been used already this morning. But it's, it's such a sweet reminder. Hebrews 4, verses 14 and 15. Hebrews 4, starting in verse 14, the writer of Hebrews tells us this wonderful truth. He says, seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but has in all points been tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He's saying here, the writer of Hebrews, that Jesus was tempted like you and I in every way, shape, and form. Any temptation that can be seen under the heavens, I believe Jesus faced at some point in time. And yet, unlike us, he had a different outcome. He was without sin. And that's what makes his resurrection inevitable because he is sinless because he never once erred never once disobeyed his heavenly father because of this he cannot be held in death it is an impossibility for death to bind him for we know that the wage of sin is death well, if Christ never sinned, how can death reign over him? How can death hold a victory above him? It simply cannot be. Romans 5, chapter, excuse me, chapter 5, verse 18 and 21, we see that we are now under a new federal headship. We are under a new master. You see, at one time, Adam represented us his failure was passed down upon us by way of original sin his disobedience to the lord we were born into sin because of this and we were all children of adam if you will romans 5 verse 18 tells us therefore is by the offense of one speaking about adam Judgment came upon all men to condemnation. So because of Adam, because of his failure, because of his disobedience of the Lord, judgment has been cast upon all who are under him. Even so, however, by the righteousness of one, 
the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Now this is speaking of Christ, who's often referred in uh, many different theological books as the second Adam. If you may be familiar with, I believe it's Hark the Herald, Angels Sing. They refer to Jesus as the second Adam from above. And this is because Jesus succeeded where Adam failed. Jesus was victorious where mankind was not. And because Jesus was righteous, because he lived a perfect life, as we looked at last week, because he laid his life down for sinful people as an atonement, he ransomed us. Because he was sinless, he cannot be dead forever. Death has no claim over him. Instead, he is the epitome and definition of life. Verse 19, going back to Romans chapter 5, says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. At one time, we were destined to die and die forever. The eternal death, as hell is often referred to. A place of no peace, of no hope, of no grace. But because of Christ, because he lived a pure life, any who has faith in him, they are able to take this truth and this promise at face value and not have to worry as to whether or not it will come to be. And that truth is that in Christ, all are made alive. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, probably very familiar to you at this time of year. 1 Corinthians 15 is often referred to as the resurrection chapter of the Bible. It's very greatly filled with the truth of how important the resurrection is. And in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 21 and 22, listen to what Paul writes about the resurrection. He says, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. We were once in Adam. We were once destined to to eternal death. But because of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, because he lived that perfect life, because he was without sin, death and the grave have no claim on him. And he, in his grace, he, in his mercy, tells us time and time again in the New Testament, you can find that those that believe on Christ shall live forevermore. He has given to us this new covenant that if we believe on him as our Lord and Savior, then we shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And it's only found in him. I tell you, this is of the utmost importance. It's not Jesus and several other ways. It is Jesus alone. He himself tells us this time and time again, but I want to point out one occurrence where he says this in John chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. John 10, starting in verse 9, Jesus says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. 
Jesus tells us clearly here, he's the way of salvation. It is only found in him. And I tell you this morning, if you have faith in Christ, it's not because of anything we have about us. It's not because we are wise in and of ourselves or because we have figured it all out. But it's because he has made it possible and because he has given us this gift that we celebrate today. We believe because he's given us the ability to believe. He's given us the gift of salvation. Ephesians 2.8 is very clear on that. For by grace are ye saved through faith, not, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Brothers and sisters, we have been given a great gift. And that is that we have hope in Jesus Christ. We do not have to face the grave forever. We do not have to face the punishment for our sins. He has atoned on our behalf. And because he was perfect in every way, death cannot hold him. As we go back to Revelations, it tells us he holds the key of hell and death. They are in his hands. And I tell you, when I picture that in my mind, I see ownership. Jesus is owner ship there he owns those keys no one's going to take them from him no one's able to pluck you out of his hand if you believe on him you can take his word to be truth and he is risen and he will die no more and those who believe on him though we may physically die in this life as a result of our sinful bodies we will not stay dead. We will not be in the grave forever. But instead, we have hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ. So I want to end with one last passage of scripture this morning. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. This is the hope of the resurrection. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What a beautiful blessing that is.